Hi, this is Chris German from The Apartment Dealer, and with me today is Mr. Gil Figueroa. Gil has now been a commercial lender for the past 30 years and has successfully closed over a thousand commercial loans. And we bring Gil in here uh, today with us to give some insight to apartment landlords, what's all involved in the commercial loan process, what's currently going on in the market, what does Gil see uh, successful investors doing when it comes to multifamily. So Gil, thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, I'd like to start maybe a little more granular than we have in the past. Um, we don't want to just assume that everyone understands the ins and outs of a commercial loan. Uh, probably truth be told, uh, many of our viewers just went to a lender, maybe their realtor knew, went with whatever bank that lender chose for them and, and didn't really fully understand what was going through the process. So let's start with interest rates. How, how do the banks determine interest rates? Do they just pick them out of thin air? Do they just shop each other like uh, cereal brands with Kellogg's versus so-and-so? Or, or how are these interest rates determined? That's a good question, Chris. Um, it's, it's actually both what you mentioned. It's like on a competitive stage and also based on treasury and their personal cost of funds of what they lend on. So there's always a margin in between of what their um, T-bills that they offer the saving consumer versus what they offer a spread on the loan is concerned. So it's a combination of all three. And most banks are very competitive in this market with, within a quarter to half point range between them all. Mm -hmm. The real question is not just the rate, but what does each bank do and do well? Because they all have a certain niche. Mm -hmm. Some are good at uh, value add properties. Some are good at deferred maintenance. Some are good at um, working with a buyer with credit issues or income issues. And some have the absolute best rate, but they want the absolute perfect deal. So it really matters um, understanding the complexity and all the variables of different banks and what their um, pros and cons are and how to navigate through that. And that's what we do for the client. So in essence, we're an app for the client where they can find the best lending situation for their objective in that particular situation. And in terms of differences, so we talk about these loans as commercial loans, and then there's also residential loans. So residential loan would be if you're buying a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, you would get a residential loan. Once you step into the fifth unit or larger, now that becomes a commercial loan. So I explained the simple dis, uh, difference, but what, what are the complexities of this? How do commercial loans differ from a traditional residential loan? Um, the main difference is who the uh, secondary market buyers are for residential loans, and those are typically Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have very stringent guidelines, certain global debt ratios um, that the buyer has to meet. Not the property per se, but buyer. So it's completely different format. Um, sometimes we get a buyer that's a commercial buyer and doesn't have cash flow um, strong enough to buy a four unit, and yet he's able to buy 40 units. So it's kind of an interesting uh quagmire that happens between four and over. Um, also at under four or four and under, you're able to go 20 or 25% down on a non-owner mm -hmm. where multifamily is strictly based on the debt service of the asset. So the net operating income is going to determine that bottom line maximum loan amount. Uh, for example, I was in the process of purchasing a four unit loan and for a, for a fourplex. And of course, that's a residential loan. And Gil, at the same time, was processing a loan for me for a nine unit property. The process of getting the loan for the four unit was a nightmare. And then the nine unit was so much different in terms of what uh, the bank was requesting. But the interest rate was also higher on the four unit property versus the loan that we got for the nine unit. So maybe a little bit deeper in terms of, do you find that that's true, that it's more interestingly enough complex to get a loan amount, a loan for a two to four unit? And oftentimes the loan amounts are less than to get a loan, say for a five or five unit or larger building. As far as the complexity question, Chris, again, we go back to the fact that the four unit underwrites based on a global underwriting. So I'm sure they asked you for everything. They asked you for corporate returns, LLCs, rent statements on all your assets, everything. So they had to do a global analysis. That global analysis would have to be about 45% of your personal gross income. So that's the way that's analyzed. As far as the terms are concerned, um, typically a multifamily, they're very aggressive on the five-year product, five-year or seven-year short-term loans as far as multifamily. And they're very aggressive because they're tied to five-year or 10-year treasury. Mm 
Fannie Mae products are tied to more longer term treasuries and they're not very competitive on shorter term loans. But the the add on or I should say the value add for four units and under is they do offer a 30 year fix in decent terms. Now, when it comes to being a viable candidate for a commercial loan, uh, this way I know I, I'm in the right position when the right deal comes along. Do I Should I be concerned with my credit, cash, size of my portfolio, history of management? I mean, what are they going to be looking at so that when, again, when the right deal comes along, I'm not fumbling through paperwork, but I'm prepared? Right. Chris, that's a great question. And, and in reality, it's a combination of everything you mentioned. Um, my suggestion, number one is and foremost is, Give me a call in five minutes. I can basically uh, ask you very basic questions and get a good understanding of your overall situation and then uh, recommend a product line. But with that being said, I would say they're all important. Credit is important. Um, now, can we do cre uh, credit lender uh, loans for people with credit issues? Absolutely. Um, net worth is also important. Right now in this environment, lenders are tightening up and the first time buyer is being looked at a lot more critically right now. So they're looking at their net worth, they're looking at their credit. And more importantly, right now, specific lenders are increasing their reserve requirements. For instance, Chase right now is requiring 20% of all real estate debt, or actually all debt, to have um, a, liquidity, a liquidity standard of 20% thereof. So for an example's sake, if you have $20 million of loan and debt, uh, Chase would ask to see $4 million of liquidity. So with that being said, it's a combination of all. And the quickest answer to that is just a phone call away. And we can really solve that problem and find out what meets your objective. We have loans for credit issues. We have loans for deferred maintenance on the asset. We have loans for um, stated income. So if your tax rolls just don't make sense, we can solve that problem on commercial loans. Now, so let's dig into a little bit of strategy. So when I'm framing the conversation with our clients regarding multifamily, I like to go under the guise of we're, we're building a financial legacy, right? Uh, that's essentially what it amounts to. And in the building of this financial legacy, there's three pillars, as I've coined it. Uh, the first pillar is maximization. First, we have to grapple with and ensure that we're maximizing what it is that we currently own. Uh, from the side of my table, that would be ensuring rental rates uh, are as high as they can be so that the property is worth that much more, uh, worth that much more money. And whatever that it means to the capital improvements that are needed, especially in light of rent control and these type of things. From your side of the table in terms of maximization, how does or, uh, an investor get the full juice from that lemon in terms of what they currently own? Good question, Chris. Um, as far as maximization, what we look at is a, a, a personal portfolio for each and every buyer. And we look at their portfolio and we look at what their hold periods are, what their objectives are with each product that they own. So if there's a value add deal that they're looking at, it's short term, we might recommend a different product line. If it's long term, we might go with a Fannie Mae loan, which is 20 year fixed. So it just really depends on what their portfolio and objectives, just like a financial planner. We're going to look through each and every asset, what financing they have on it and suggest based on their objectives. And given the fact that you're a multifamily uh, investor as well, aside of the lending aspect, uh, what do you do or how would you encourage uh, our viewers to maximize the properties that they're currently holding? Well, that, that's a great question. Number one, are they holding the right loan? Do they have the right loan right now? Are they out of their prepaid stage? Can they benefit from today's rates, which are three and a half percent? Is there a benefit there? So number one, look at the financing. Number two, do they have a game plan to raise or improve the asset? What can they do? They should meet with you possibility or talk to you or talk to others in our group as far as how to raise those rents, how to improve the asset, how to get their situation as far as their objectives met. Um, that's my suggestion for one. Yeah. And at our upcoming educational event, we're going to discuss a lot of this because the good old days of just issuing 60 day notices to vacate so you can take back a unit are long and gone. And so we're going to be discussing some strategy. How do you um, get our, uh, work through this rent cap that we currently are under? Second pillar uh, is now growth. So they've maximized what they currently own. They've poised themselves either for a refinance or a 1031 exchange. Now, I've been putting forth the argument that in light of rent control, where the state essentially is saying, hey, you can raise your rents 5% a year plus CPI. And I imagine that'll change over time. I can't imagine it'll get better for landlords, probably when it'll get worse, right? Uh, but 
that means essentially you know what you're going to make this year, next year, three years from now, nine years from now, if your current tenants hunker down, right? So in order to leapfrog uh, this cap, really one of the best ways is through a 1031 exchange, right? If you find that you could increase your income, say, by 20%, 25%. I mean, we've had one client increase it by 31% doing a direct exchange, not adding any new cash, just carrying over equity. What, you, what is that? Four or five times they leapfrog the rate in terms wow. of increasing their rent. So that's from the, the, the realtor side of it, if you will. In terms of growth, what would you advise of multifamily investors to not stay stagnant so that they don't become complacent, but they get more of the good stuff, more income, all the benefits that are associated with multifamily? I think now more than ever, Chris, they should be meeting with you and getting a game plan on that particular asset that they own versus what the market can offer and really see the difference and and look at the objective and look at this objectively. Um, another uh, problem or issue that could come up is Prop 13, which has been talked about and discussed. And right now an exchange would solve that problem. So there's a lot of things going on in today's market where a game plan is needed and is highly recommended on each and every asset you own. Now, you and I both work with investors who say own one five unit property, uh, investors who own five properties and then investors who own uh, 500 units, right? And everyone in between. Sticking on this idea of growth, what is it that you see those that win at this game, if you will, those that have amassed a portfolio over time, what is it that they do different than those who say own the same five unit after 20 years later? They capitalize on their equity position. Every time there's a position, whether to refi or exchange, and they're getting in a better cash flow situation, there is no question they attack and they move. And when there's a great opportunity, they're ready to do so. So those are the attributes of the bigger investors that I've seen. They're able to move fast. They're able to buy fast and have the capital. So they have a game plan either to use their pertaining equity that they have or have refi already and have capital waiting just for a new acquisition or the right deal when it or comes right along deal. so that they're a viable buyer. Absolutely. And I should have maybe prefaced my comments a little bit because I'm going under the idea that more is better, right? More cash flow, more units, more tax write-offs. Um, I would have to imagine you as a multifamily investor, my, my wife and I included, that we didn't get into multifamily for 10 of headaches and to be drug into eviction court and for calls in the middle of the night and having to meet tradesmen on the weekend to deal with the leaky faucet. I mean, this all goes along with multifamily, but we look past those items because of the cash flow, the, the appreciation of our money over time and the tax write-offs. Um, now, transitioning then as someone, so they've maximized what they currently own, they poised it for growth, They've grown over time. Now they're preparing for tomorrow. Now in this lane, it's really I wanted to bring you in and talk to our, our uh, clients and so forth is because whether on this show or at our educational events, the last three times now or the last two years, you've been able to pinpoint what direction uh, rates in the market was headed, even against the tide of, of banks like uh, Chase. When they said, hey, rates are going up, you had said rates were going down. What, what do you have to share with us about the market today? Well, I'm a, let's call myself a frustrated amateur trader, and, and I really look at analytics and technicals on the 10-year treasury, and I've been studying the 10-year treasury for a long time. And back in October of 18, I had mentioned to you, rates are going down. Everyone else said rates were going up. And like you mentioned, Chase, Jamie Dimon said treasuries are headed to 5%. I said rates were going up. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the market and technicals really give us a direction. I almost call it um, forecasting the future. So at our last event, which was October of 19, um, I mentioned that rates were going up and they went from three and a half percent to four percent. Um, I believe it was probably December 2nd when I texted you and I said, the market's taking a different direction now. And since then, we went from four percent back to three and a half percent. Now, by the time we get our March seminar, um, I'm going to be able to forecast moving forward with charts. So I'll be very technical and let you know exactly where the market's headed and my opinion on that as far as that's concerned. I know at our educational event, uh, you'll dive more into the rent control issue. What does that mean to lending? What do people uh, need to be you know, concerned about? Uh, but before we leave the viewers, one last question. Let's talk about 
blunders. Again, you've been at this thing now three decades. You've seen people win and lose. And, and quite honestly, in my opinion, you got to do a lot of things wrong in order to lose in multifamily just because here in Southern California, we're um, spoiled. You know, there's high demand for rents. They continue to go up. So you got to do a lot wrong. But for those that have done things wrong, any consistent blunders you've seen amongst investors, whether it comes to financing or, or management or anything else? I think the, the main thing I've seen in the past where it's an issue is um, sellers are motivated to sell because of price and they don't have a game plan. And they get excited about a certain price because it's hit a certain threshold that, frankly, they wouldn't buy it at. So they get excited and they sell without a game plan. And then they scramble and sometimes don't, do not achieve the results they want as far as their objectives. And I think that's the number one bl blunder that they've executed a, a trade without knowing exactly where they're headed for. Mm -hmm. And that's where you come in. I think that's a very valuable asset that if you're going to do an exchange because of price, you need to know why you're doing it and what is the solution for your next asset. Because mm -hmm. being out of the market is what's hurt more people, not being in, right? being out. So that, that's my two cents as far as what I've seen in the past. All right. Well, Gil, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Gil will be joining us at our next Apartment Owners Educational Luncheon. Gil has three decades worth of uh, wisdom to share with you when it comes to the capital markets. We'll have with us Stephen Spear, multiple decades of litigating, representing landlords like yourself in the courtrooms. We'll have Dennis Block, eviction attorney extraordinaire, to explain to you the in and outs, especially with this new rent control law. We'll have Stephen Hall of Robert Hall & Associates, Again, multiple decades has his family been in the uh, tax game, and they represent everyone from the media industry to huge, huge uh, real estate investors. And to and essentially, what does that mean? They know the in and outs of this tax law and how to bring uh, savings to you. We've amassed, in my opinion, the best panel of speakers that we possibly could. For any questions that you may have, I, I would have to uh, hallucinate that you have a question or two or an issue that has been by the sideline, you haven't addressed it, or you don't want to pay the fee to sit with an attorney, even myself. I mean, it's essentially like having a free consultation with all these gentlemen. We take questions from the audience and outside of this venue, they charge. But for one day, this one short afternoon, you can have your questions specific to your challenges or your real estate strategy answered. And we look forward to having you. Again, Chris German from The Apartment Dealer, wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, and much protection for overpaying for an interest rate that you don't have to. Thank you. Thank you.